graduate students, from okay. established academics and people from outside of academia. Um, we also use this as an opportunity to give updates about our other activities at Tyresia. My name is Halfter Lünge. Uh, I'm the research manager at Tyresia and I will be facilitating today's session. Um, today's presenter is Kristen Abrahams uh, from the Legal Resources Center. Kristen holds uh, an LLB and an honors in English literature from Vich University. Uh, she's passionate about ensuring that all people have access to the opportunities and resources needed to live dignified lives. She previously worked at the Ahmed Katrada Foundation uh, in a space dedicated to strengthening democracy in South Africa. And she continues to contribute to this space at the Legal Resources Center. Uh, Kristen is also the General Secretary of the Defend Our Democracy movement. The title of Kristen's presentation is Democratizing Big Tech. Kristen, I think it's the first time you're here, so welcome to, to Tyresia and, and, and thanks for, for agreeing to come and, and uh, present to us. I certainly look forward to hearing how we can fix big tech. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and to everyone online who's joining us as well. Um, yeah, I'm Kristen Abrahams. I'm a candidate attorney at the Legal Resources Centre, um, and our primary focus is on strategic public impact litigation. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is one strand of a bigger project that we've labelled democratising big tech. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the investigation that we've done and what our findings were. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what our plans are um, in terms of future advocacy campaigns um, and, and possible litigation. Um, so I'll, I'll start with talking about the investigation that we did and how we actually found ourselves doing this work. Um, so next year is, I think, famously being dubbed um, the year of elections. I think there's something like over 70 countries going into an election year next year. Um, and South Africa being one of those, I know there's there's calls that 2024 is going to be our 1994, um, and there's all of this um, there's tension and hype and excitement around next year's elections, um, and I think in trying to figure out where we would have some sort of intervention, the Legal Resources Center um, has joined a global coalition um, that's called the Glo the Global Coalition for Tech Justice, um, and what we're looking at is how big tech or social media or ad tech platforms um, can really be held accountable for the content that is posted on those platforms um, and how we do that strategically so that we can curb misinformation and hate speech and disinformation and incitement to violence prior to the elections and over the elections period, um, but then sort of have a longer term strategy as well for, for how we can do that going forward. Um, so what our main focus has been up until this point is really what we do at the Legal Resources Centre. Um, a lot of the time is we sort of do investigations that lay the basis for any prospective litigation. Um, and so the first investigation that we did was um, with or in collaboration with a partner called Global Witness. And Global Witness, um, a couple of times before this, but it was the first time that they had tried it in South Africa, tests the efficacy of social media platforms in implementing their own content moderation policies. Um, and so just maybe let me step back and say there's a difference between content that's posted on social media and then adverts which are paid for and which are targeted at specific groups of people. Um, what we'd be testing in specifically is the, the advert part of it. And so we we would and we have paid um, an advertising fee. We've been able to target specific groups of people, but we we haven't really done that. But particularly, we're testing content moderation with adverts because adverts have a more stringent or seemingly more stringent um, verification process than normal content posted on social media does. And so what we did um, leading up to International Refugee Day this year is we submitted 38 adverts across Facebook and TikTok and YouTube. Um, and what those adverts were made of was really, like, really and hate. He's one of my favorite guys to bet with. Um, he really guided me through my news today. Uh, 
Sorry, I thought it was too cute to ask. Um, so it, it was made up of really just hateful vitriol um, spewed at, at nationals living in South Africa and migrants and refugees. Um, and so I won't say exactly what what they said, but the, the adverts included sort of incitement to shoot and kill foreigners. Um, some of them compared refugees to cockroaches and diseases. Um, we used we used South African lingo, so we used words like makwere kwere, and we we were able to put that in as well. Um, and I think the critical part is that we we submit these adverts for approval, but we don't actually run them. So Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube allows you to schedule a date for posting, but they they do the verification process way before that date. So we'd schedule these adverts for two weeks in advance, and then we waited. Um, to see what the outcomes would be in terms of the approval process. And the I think the, the results weren't shocking, but they were really disheartening. Um, TikTok and YouTube accepted all 38 adverts. Facebook accepted 36 of them. I think they rejected the two adverts that were in English and Afrikaans um, that compared refugees to cockroaches, but it, it accepted all of the others. So we did... Um, 10 in English and 10 in Afrikaans, and then we did nine in Isinkosa and nine in Isizulu. And those were the adverts that we submitted. Um, we then wrote to them afterwards with the results of our investigation and said, you know, this is this is what we found. We are concerned that the, the content moderation policies aren't actually being implemented as they say they will be. We have a particular concern around elections in South Africa in 2024, when we know either that there will be heightened tensions leading to incitement of violence over social media, particularly focused or targeted at refugees and migrants in the country, or even that that would be used, I think, by some political parties as a, as a tactic. Um, I think Facebook's response, I'll read it to you because I just printed it out. Um, Meta said, these adverts violate our policies and have been removed. Despite our ongoing investments, we know that there will be examples of things we miss or we take down in error, as both machines and people make mistakes. Um, the TikTok, TikTok spokesperson said um, they were investigating our findings and the current moderators speak Afrikaans, Tosa and Zulu, and they said that content passes through multiple levels of verification before receiving approval. Um, so it wasn't really a commitment to change anything, just telling us that they do have content moderation and content verification processes. Um, as we understand it, it's sort of like a two-tiered process. So first, um, an AI machine program detector would detect any sort of hate speech on the platform. And then the second round would be that an, an actual human content moderator would then check it and flag it as either hate speech or incitement to violence or disinformation. Um, but I think something that we 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 flat really don't know much about these content moderation policies because and maybe maybe deliberatively so deliberately so um the content moderation um policies are quite vague on how many content moderators are employed in each country um what languages they speak what the understanding is of the nuances and context within different countries um and then i yeah i think our main call which is what 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 we're making now. Um, so we're running a, a second investigation. And this time we're focusing on hate speech aimed at um, female journalists in, in South Africa in particular. And so both for, for the, the previous investigation that we ran and this one, we actually have taken real life examples. So off Twitter, off Facebook, off YouTube, and we, we're using those, but we, we package it as an ad so that it goes through that, that verification process. Um, We'll have the results for this one soon. I was running the YouTube account um, and, and mostly, I think majority of the adverts they were, were accepted. Um, we used, we used real life examples of really hateful language and attacking language against journalists like Fabio Hafferty, um, against, I think Karen Morn was one of them as well. Um, we took, I think some of the posts that were, that were used against Nicole Fritz who isn't a journalist, but is a, a civil society um, actor. And so um, majority of those, those were accepted as well. And so we're using all of this research to form the basis for a campaign that we are calling Democratizing Big Tech, 
And that's our LRC um, localized version of the global campaign for tech justice. But what we are asking for in particular is that um, both at global and country levels, that these major ad tech companies will design fully and equitably resourced action plans. And why we say equitable is because what they're doing currently is that they, it's not, they, they don't give plans that are proportionate to risk or to harm. And um, basically we are making the argument that they aren't actually safeguarding the rights of South Africans and others in countries that are experiencing similar problems. Um, we, we want these action plans to contain 10 fundamental features. They must mainstream, uh, mainstream international human rights and electoral standards. Um, they must publish and respond to findings of robust human rights impact assessments. Um, they must be proportionate to risk of harm, not market size. And what we mean there, for instance, is even where the social media platforms invest in content moderation, it's really inequitable. So I think the statistic is something, and I, I, I'll be sure to check the year, but in a particular year, they had allocated for the content moderation and global remit coverage, something like 84% of their resources to moderating content in the US, with 16% being earmarked for the rest of the world, which is crazy because the US itself only makes up like 10% of Facebook's users. Um, and I, I think in, in saying that, what we're finding is that where Facebook, TikTok, Meta, um, well, Meta and YouTube, so Google, have headquarters is where they actually are more stringent with their content moderation. Um, so both that they implement the policies more stringently there, but also then that they have those countries informing their policies. Um, they, there hasn't been any sort of outreach to other countries to ask what, what would be needed, particularly in those countries, how they can partner with third party organizations within the country, um, and, and just for general um, sort of contribution to, to their policies from these countries. Um, <coughs> I, I think maybe I'll stop there. I can share all of what we've done. We've, we've posted all of it in a report that's on the Legal Resources Center website. Um, but then there's also a bunch of resources on the Global Coalition for Tech Justice website. Um, and there is really the, all the sort of social media Finally, social media um, resources and, and, and items that we can all share are, are posted um, and the global campaign and the advocacy asks as well. Um, maybe just let me share one more thing, which is, so, so this is our ongoing plan and we'll continue rolling out these investigations so that we can gather some, some information. Um, part of what we want to do next year is to actually litigate against some of these um, companies or, or platforms. Um, and we were talking to a colleague about it, and one of, I, I can't remember where they tried this, I think it might have been in India, but she was saying to us that because of the algorithmic model and the targeted advertising model that these companies use, um, scrolling on social media is almost an addictive thing, as is gambling or alcohol or whatever else. And so I think they use that sort of strategy to say, because it has this addictive nature to it, it actually needs regulation like these other things do. Um, I think what we're thinking about is, is tackling it more from a human rights perspective and approach. And I think particularly we'd be able to make a case for the rights of children um, not being protected on, on social media, but then, but then just the rights in the constitution in general. Um, so that's planned for next year. But our main ask for now, and that would, that would obviously be also um, that would be an ask of our government to actually start regulating and 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 coming up with leg enacting legislation to regulate the space. But for now and for the short term, ask leading up to elections, um, we're really just trying to make a noise and have an advocacy campaign to get actually properly resourced plans. Um, as we understand it, it's sort of like just turning up a dial on content moderation. So it would it would be like South Africa is having an election right now. Let's just cut like stream, more stringently moderate at this point. And that's what we're asking for in the short term. Um, but then also that there are things like like action plans um, and human rights impact assessments and the like. All right. Thanks for that. Sorry, that's a mouthful. <laughs> mouthful. Very short and to the point, and I'm sure a lot. Uh, questions and comments from, from, from the floor and online. So please, uh, if anyone wants to start, I'm looking both in the room as well as online. Online, if you can just raise your hand. 
think that's the easiest alternative. You can also write your question or your comment in the chat. Uh, yeah, Karen. Thank you, Kristen. Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. Um, obviously, you think about it from a government perspective, or I do. Um, and just thinking about, say, the, the July uprising in 2021, um, and the, the trolling of accounts that happened. Um, would a protection like this guard against that kind of thing, or is that systemic and outside of what you know? This is just like ordinary posts. Yeah. So, so I think that's the tricky thing because there's the whole freedom of expression argument, which is in particular around just content that's posted. Um, and and I think our focus is on adverts, particularly because it has a more um, stringent, narrow verification process. It, I, I don't know how we'd be able to, to regulate that ordinary content posting because the only way that that's actually checked by a content moderator is when that's flagged by somebody else. So you either report it as inappropriate or whatever the case may be. Um, so I, I don't think we'd, we'd be able, I don't think we'd be able to regulate that or I don't know how we'd be able to regulate that. Um, for now, we're focusing on the easier thing, which is that your advert policies or your content moderation policies say this. And this actually goes through a process of verification. Why isn't it being done at that level? Um, I think all of these, all of these platforms do post um, often about how fast they take down timings around content that's posted like that. But it's it's like next to nothing. I, I know the Khutsufete is on the call as well. He was talking to us about how many posts um, are actually posted per day around the world. I can't remember the figure, and maybe he can share with us, but it's it's almost impossible that you'd even have that amount of human beings to to be taking it down at that at that speed. Mm. But but from a governance level, uh, the, our own government released a, a white paper recently. Um, I can't remember what it was called, but all that really looked at is um, like the regulation of Netflix and Hulu and those sort of accounts. And there was no attention paid to social media at all. So I don't even think it's something that's like on their radar or that they're thinking about. And I think when we think about the, the real life repercussions that come as a result of what's posted on social media, we think it needs to be sort of at the, at the forefront of, of what's being spoken about. Thanks for the presentation. I'm really interested. Um, I think while I was sitting the, the, the two questions I had, um, the first one and um, kind of touched on was about um, you know not having enough uh, content moderation moderators, but isn't there? And I know there is a way. Is, there should be a way to um, to flag it because an advert on social media is not the same as an advert on TV. However, there has to be a, a system to only flag flag and pull. And is there a um, a legal framework to cover that? You know, be, be, you know. Because if you're going to say you're going to have a lawsuit or any kind of, um, of action, there has to be a framework covering it. And then the second question um, that I had was around. Oh God, so I have to come okay. back. Okay, <laughs> good because I would have forgotten you. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the okay. Second one. okay. Um, you see, I almost forgot it because <laughs> I'm thinking about what I want to say. Um, so, so what they don't tell us is how many content moderators they have. That's the first thing. The second thing is they don't tell us what languages those content moderators speak. And then thirdly, they don't tell us what languages the AI machines are programmed to, to detect. Um, so, so we know very little about that, actually, unless we write to them and say, can you give us a breakdown of these things? That that information isn't just generally known. Um, there isn't existing legislation in South Africa that would cover that at all. Um, so I think we looked at the the like the, the Broadcasting and Communications Act, and it it doesn't cover it in sufficient detail. Um, and there would need to be a whole new legislation. So the EU has something called the Digi Digital Services Act, um, and and that encompasses. Firstly, the need to, to routinely undertake and publish the findings of human rights impact, like human rights impact assessments. And then there are also fines where, where content moderation policies aren't upheld. We don't have a similar act. 
Um, I, I, I don't know that the AU has, has been working on, on something like that. Um, but I, I think, and again, the Chutzofit spoke at one of our events, and that's why I keep saying yes. <laughs> um, But one of the things he was also saying is that a lot of the time South Africa sort of just copy pastes from, from other regions. And I think it would it would necessitate us looking a bit more inwardly, and in, particularly at the African region, and thinking about what's relevant here and what we need to be moderating. And I'll give you an example. When we were writing our report, we were just looking at like general examples of what's actually taken down on Facebook. Um, and there was a mother in, in I think, either one of the Middle Eastern or African countries. Um, and she had posted something about her child being a black diamond, you know, affectionately. And that was flagged and that was pulled down. <laughs> and then there's like grossly hateful things against refugees. It's just left up there. Um, but I, I think it would, it necessitates understanding of the context here within countries in particular. Um, hopefully we do get some legislation. May I ask what I remember? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so I, I know that the IEC, along with the, I can't remember the number, I think about 12 African um, electoral bodies um, signed an agreement around uh, with SABC, with uh, Meta, with Google around uh, preventing um, misinformation dis and, and, and malinformation. Um, in your work, are you also dealing with, with that uh, as particularly around the elections, because especially next year is a very big event for, for South Africa. I, I know you touched on it, but like um, specifically on that yes, particular yes. agreement. We, we haven't looked at that agreement at all, to be honest, and I'll, I'll actually make a note of that because it, it is something that we should be looking at. Um, my Just my feel would be that because they have moderation policies that speak to disinformation, they say we have these policies that speak mm. to disinformation. And the main thing around um, is actually around implementation of the policies. They, mm. they disinformation and they have disinformation in particularly in relation to elections. So they even cover, you know, that, mm. but they, it's just the implementation that really just doesn't happen. Mm. But, but we haven't looked at that agreement in particular, no. Okay, thank you. Um, Perhaps while people are still thinking about the questions or comments, I can uh, use my role as, as chair here. Yeah. Um, so if I understood correctly, you focus on sort of explicit advertising. Mm. And I think you mentioned early eight adverts and describing them like fair and blunt, yeah. racist, xenophobic messages, um, where the adverts can be manually removed or moderated somehow. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg, and I'm obviously you're aware of that. But I was just curious of whether you were doing anything or thinking about that. Everything that's sort of underneath, uh, which is really driven by like different types of algorithms, like unsupervised algorithms that just self-optimize in order to, you know, maximize engagement or maximize which is probably a lot more dangerous for society from a exactly. democratic perspective, perspective, et cetera, where you can't necessarily point to, well, this is, so, so, so the legal angle might not work because mm -hmm. you can't say, well, this is a, a yeah. speech, right? yeah. whatever, whatever, because it's so subtle and mm -hmm. we don't even know that we are being manipulated, yeah. polarized. And it's not just, I think mm -hmm. you use the term, it's just a question of turning up or turning down a mm -hmm. dial. Which is perhaps true for some things like what you described, but for the others, well, nobody nobody yeah. knows what these algorithms, even the tech companies themselves, don't know what that algorithm is because it constantly changes in order to I know it's it's beyond yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> so it's just curious if, if it's something you're talking about or thinking about or yeah. Sure. So beyond what I'm talking about, also very much out of my new house. I'm a lawyer. So this is yeah, this is this really is us just dipping our toes and yeah. Um so when we started testing the ad, but that's exactly what I actually was proposing to my team. And I was saying, why don't we test the more subtle stuff? Let's see what happens. Would they be able to pick that up? And the reason that we tested the, the blunt, um, obvious, you know non hidden stuff is literally because we wanted to show if you're accepting this, you'd accept all the subtle stuff as mm -hmm. well. Um, so, so particularly we used that approach like quite strategically. Um, the stuff around algorithms, Global Witness did, um, did an investigation. I think uh, 
I can't remember what region it was in particular, um, but you can also look at their website and, and they have their research reports. They did do one where they tested algorithms in particular. Um, and I think they did it in a specific region and saw what was being targeted. So if it was India at a specific time, they would be fed, um, you know, like hate speech against Pakistan nationals, for instance, at that point. Mm. Um, but it, it, it was more about where the account was created and less about who was using it. And, and I think that's the big thing that we that we're focusing on, that there's this disparity between regions, geographical regions, and, and how they are being treated based on where you create an account. We I think we're aware of of the algorithmic model. And I think that's why we're making um our our campaign is largely focused on also saying to people, and, and we recently came up with a sort of line, um, like social media knows you, do you know it? Or it understands you, do you understand it? Um, and I think really we're just trying to empower people to be more aware of what they're seeing and what they're posting and what they're sharing. Um, but I, I don't know what we'd what, what we'd be able to look at in terms of of algorithms. Um, like you say, the social media companies themselves don't even know anything. It would be so difficult to point out and say, let's regulate this in, in this way. So there's an awareness of it, but but I don't know what what we would be doing. I can't say that we we've done anything yet. Um, or we've conceptualized how to address that in the norm. Because there is this ongoing debate about algorithmic audits of like, it has to be open and external auditors have to be able to go in and look at these algorithms mm -hmm. for, for transparency reasons and, and, and accountability. And then, you know, so obviously there's also limitations of how far you can go from a legal angle because it becomes a sociological, psychological issue, of course, yeah. Others, I'm but, to sorry, just to say, yeah. that I think that's why it's useful that we have conversations like this because we don't have that understanding and know how at all. So it actually would be useful to have someone like you or anyone else in the room come in and okay. say, not you, <laughs> come in and say this. Are you actually focusing on this as well? Because this is important. Is there a way? Because we we actually we haven't even started thinking in that direction at all. So. Yeah, it would be something that we need to, like, someone needs to probe us and tell us what to also be looking at. And I see Turkey is online, so uh, maybe we'll make a connection. Turkey okay. works in the data science uh, okay. institute here at the university. Uh, so he might be an interesting person to talk to. Questions, more comments, questions? Yes? Yeah. You said earlier that people turn up the dial before the election. What's the premise be that people campaign mm. on the basis of racial identity or, or, or what is it? Yeah, a couple of things. One, that people will campaign on either racial identity or anti foreigner rhetoric or whatever else it is. Two, that there's always like exacerbated tensions and incitement to violence in particular during election periods. And so with the, um, that's why specifically with the the, the first investigation we did, we, we put in posts that had incitement to violence in some way. So it was testing both hate speech and incitement to violence. Um, and yeah, then I think the, just that it that we want not to have disinformation around elections. So one of the things we were, we were thinking of testing was um, like you need a COVID-19 vaccination to register to vote. Um, could also you could target a very specific group of people. So I think I think Facebook has removed like the racial um, tick boxes for who you can target, which can still target a group of people living in a certain area. Yeah, and because we're so racially geographically split, that it's not difficult to still like go through that reform. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, I can see you, Turkey. Thank you. Oh, yes. Who's hand in this? Daniel. Daniel, please go ahead. It's mine, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to ask, given what you've kind of presented here, do you think that there's any responsibility for South Africa themselves to create some sort of non-biased organization that you know at least flags these things when they see it or, or something along those lines or do you think that i mean ideally sole responsibility is on facebook etc but 
is there any reason that we should do something ourselves? Uh, sure. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so, so Meta's policies, and I, I'm pretty sure YouTube has the same policy, um, but they have a policy that requires them to partner with fact-checking third-party organizations within the countries in which they operate. Um, Media Monitoring Africa is one of, of those organizations in South Africa, and they do that fact-checking work. Um, but when I was speaking to the lady at Media Monitoring Africa, she was saying to me, they've They've never been involved in, in content moderating adverts at all. So I I think that, that that there's another gray area there about to what extent third party organizations are involved um, and at what rate they would also be able to, to take down information or flag it. Um, Media Monitoring Africa is a small organization made up of very few people. Um, and I know I know that they they are continuously trying to do that work as well. Um, but I think to a very limited degree. I, I think it would be I think it would be useful, um, and I think that's part of what we would recommend that more third party organisations based in the country are partnered with. Um, but I, I yeah I, I think I I would maintain that there's there's still more responsibility on the platform itself. Um, yeah, it would be a very slow takedown and and detection rate. What's yeah, the, no, I, I agree. Um, maybe I just want to, you know, end with a comment, which is this is awesome work and please do litigate. I think, you know, you mentioned earlier, 85% of their resources is allocated to the US. I'm sure that's a financial incentive, um, you know, mm -hmm. that they, they've done that. Um, so the, the best way to make change is to litigate and make them pay for, for some of these yeah. things. Yeah, and, and with technologies like ChatGPT, it should be pretty damn easy for them to you know, algorithmically cut off a lot of these bad, uh, bad adverts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they really don't have an excuse. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to abuse my position again. I'm going to say this. I, I, I agree with Daniel. Continues a little bit, but I'm also thinking like, again, so, sorry, I'm, maybe I'm repeating this. Okay. There's, there is a, really a limit to how far you can go. Oh, sure. And and you are kind of like doing what's possible given the existing framework. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there's a bigger question around what, what is the existing framework? Is it the right framework? Like, yeah. because, and, it, and, and that framework is like we as society, as policymakers, we are constantly behind and we're just trying to catch up, mm -hmm. which means all these big tech companies, they have an advantage. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, so the whole system is like bias. Or their their yeah. So the, 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 the question like, well, is this enough or mm. do we need more radical approaches? That, I think that's like the regulation and really, you know, do we need to nationalize this? Because this is critical infrastructure. It is too powerful to leave in the hands of a private sector. Or, mm. This is just like hypothetical questions, but again, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think around the first question about what the existing framework is, you're 100% correct about that. So even the, the things that the, the global coalition is asking for, like human rights impact assessments, um, like properly resourcing content moderation, paying, these, uh, paying moderators properly, giving them cycle support, those sort of things, those are all from the Digital Services Act. So that's literally from an existing framework. But like I was saying, that might not be relevant for us um, as, an, as a region in Africa um, as well. And you're, you're right in asking, is it the correct framework and is, a, is not a more radical one needed? Um, you could, I, I don't have anything to say except that I agree <laughs> with you. Then we are listening. Why were the questions? Oh, <laughs> no, they were playing catch up. And that it, it, is, it, is, oh. it is skewed in their favor because we're trying to regulate something that was so specifically designed uh, and and as a profitable thing, and so with this profit involved, it's obviously always always difficult to actually get that regulation perfected. Um, do we need to nationalize this? Just ask me. I, like, I don't know, radical radical think, approaches. Radical approaches. Yeah, I, I don't know if I think that nationalization is that. <laughs> so I, I I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and I guess that that also like lends itself to conversations around like data protection. All we really have is like popping 
and that doesn't speak adequately to this sort of thing and data harvesting and what's being done with our our data. So I, I think that goes into that speaks a lot to that question because I don't know where that data is, can be transferred either. We sort of put it in like you will do good with it. So your hesitation is because you don't trust the alternative, namely the <laughs> yeah, public sector. Yeah, is. yeah, but I, I mean that 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 is a, that that is definitely a, a radical alternative. Um, I don't think that would even happen to be honest with you. I don't see how how these platforms would be okay with that at all. Obviously, wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah. As um, listening to Daniel and listening to Half Dan, my additional question is that surely you should also be going after the people who place the adverts on the on these platforms. And particularly in the South African context, um, a lot of politicians very happily um, play into the gallery. So the direction that they see, see whatever going, they play into it. So uh, I think there should be a point where people start to get held to account. And then we've seen with other, other elections in other countries where um, external parties, um, so there was a case uh, with Nigeria, they had a whole bunch of, um, well, for lack of a better word, Yahoo boys, who are hired to interfere in other elections and the elections also in the US and elections in Europe. So um, there has to be like a, a, a bigger way, so outside, away from South Africa, but a bigger way to also deal with uh, people interfering in elections in that way uh, through advertising on social media. You know, um, you, have, you have to get, you have to um, approach it at different levels. Yes, for sure. So, no, for sure. Um, are, you, are there plans? We haven't thought about that either. Um, I think it, it, it's because it, we, we do it through litigation, right? And they would have to be either, so if you took a post that was extremely hateful, for instance, and then you'd, or incitement to violence, you'd use the constitutional provisions for that, right? Um, so you'd say this is not freedom of expression because it, it goes against this in a particular way. I mean, that would be one court case that would take like a year, probably. And a judge who we don't know what like what the outcome would be either. And I can't imagine how many people you'd have to do that for. Just like going oh like on in a day, you'd probably have like a million. Um so I, we haven't thought about that, but I it would have to be it would have to be strategic in that it speaks to what's enabling that instead of the individual person posting it, I think. Like, if that answers it. No, I, it does answer. It's just that I feel that if we had a Couple of high-profile cases, you know, just it's so that the, the standard. Yeah. That that that's interesting. I, I will raise that with with our team as well. Thank you. How should we deal with the adverts that are questionable? Because okay, maybe it's just my algorithm. That I always see, and I I don't get questionable adverts except now in this week I got some random Israeli propaganda kind of stuff that was. Coming in, but usually I don't see any um, questionable ads. Racist adverts. Yeah, maybe. Give them mildly questionable. Um, or is it algorithm? I think it's it your algorithm. I really do think so. What does that Okay. I really do think so. So also, it's also when we say adverts, it's literally because that's what they're calling it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's not. It's like we're not. We don't make a nice, pretty, fancy ad with yeah. anything. It's literally we just put terrible words on. Like I think we did it on like Canva or something. Like a really silly thing. Also made it an MP4, and that's what we used. Um. So it's it. It might even come as like a like a picture. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I I could show you. I could show you guys some of the. I could show you. I can show you what we did, but you'll see how absolutely silly it is. Um, but I think it's leads to that iceberg. Yeah. 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 Like we're talking. You'd never see that. Very small yeah. things. Yeah. And, and people right that they are targeted for people that. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, Daniel, go ahead. Sorry. I'm also interested how, um, when you put up these adverts for review, I think you might have to specify how much money you're going to put in for the reach of that advert. 
And I'm wondering if, um, you know, they only have stringent controls if it goes above some sort of threshold on that reach. So yeah, any, any more information on that? That's a good question because we've always set it at like the lowest, like 10 rand. <laughs> um, first, because we're an NGO and second, because we just, we just wanted to do the minimum to see if it would be approved. I, I, we, we haven't tested that. Um, and there's nothing in their policies that say, you know, it would be more stringent. Obviously, it's not going to say we'd be more stringent up, up to a certain amount or whatever. Um, and we we haven't tested that. I don't know if we would. I don't know if we would because I, I'm not sure how much we'd want to like put more more monetary resources into that. Um, I, I don't think that Global Witness has tested that either. We've always just done the, the minimum that you have to do um, in order to get to get it as a paid ad grant. Okay. Cool. Anything else? Checking no online in the room. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. Oh. Uh, we are just applied for a research grant, an IRF research grant for a project that looks specifically at youth social sort of online offline political behavior and political polarization okay. so uh, assuming we get the funding then perhaps that will also give us a platform or a starting point for perhaps talking more about yeah. possible research collaboration so uh, sure that sounds really good more to follow <laughs> hopefully we'll get the funding and then we can continue the conversation okay uh we have about five ten minutes left and i just want to give you all an update on some of the things we've been up to since we saw you last time in early october so on the 16th to 19th october we we say the civic tech innovation network co-hosted the civic tech innovation forum and we were debating a little bit about the participation but i think we agreed there was around 400 registered participants and around 250 to 300 uh, attendees. So it was a very, very nice event. Uh, I know some of you were, were there. Um, so I, I think it was a success, but uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add on that. No, you're still digesting. Yes, it was successful. <laughs> um so that's took a lot of energy in october uh this month we also have a long list of uh, activities so on monday i think it's the 6th of november we are co-hosting with the national treasury and the world bank a workshop uh, on enabling creative procurement in south africa the role of academic institutions so that's on monday and i think it's a half day workshop if i'm if i'm not mistaken yeah on 20th november uh we are launching the working paper series that you guys have been hearing about for the last year or so some of you also contributed to the working paper series so we'll have a little launch event uh on the 20th november in the evening and then three days later on the 23rd of november we are co-hosting a workshop with uh, ushahidi in Nairobi, kenya uh, Again, it takes a starting point in two of the working papers in the workshop will focus on digital technology and electoral integrity, specifically in the context of Kenya. Uh, so we'll start with a focus on Kenya, but we are hoping to kind of like use that as a, you know, a launch pad for, for more work in this space. Uh, so that's on the 23rd of November. And then next month, uh, between the 7th and the 10th of December, uh, we are running a panel and presenting some research at the Amepa Menapar annual conference in Cairo, Egypt. So Amepa and Menapar are the two regional public policy research associations in North Africa and in uh, East. And Uncle Kame is going to represent us at that conference. Um, finally, we've started uh, our planning for, for next year, for 2024. Uh, obviously, the big event will be iSculp. I think uh, last month we saw the little video that was produced. Uh, so, as you probably know, we are co hosting uh, iSculp together with the South African government. So, iSculp is the international conference on governance that we then are co hosting with, uh, with the South African government.
government. Um, so that will be a big focus, obviously, next year. Um, in addition, I mean, we're still working. There's two book projects uh, that we are either editing or co-editing. So some of you are already involved in these projects, but we'll also hear more about that. And we expect them to publish both of these books during ISCOV, which is in October next year. So that's just a quick update of, I think, the most important highlights. Um, the next lunchbox is on Thursday, the 7th of December. And I think you'll receive more information about that uh, sometime in the coming week. Um, unless there's anything else, then maybe one last round of applause. I have one, one thing I've done. <laughs> Joining us, those are sleeping. Others, okay. Something to say. Oh, the first person. Yeah. Um, just one last thing that please be on the lookout for our podcast. I'm not sure if you had mentioned that. I didn't. Sorry. Yes. Also, in the backup, and you'll hear more about that shortly. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. All the best. Have a good day. And I'll see you all on the 7th of December, if not before. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.